So next, let's deal with Romans, because that, that pretty much follows on from Galatians in terms of a lot of the same themes come about in both Romans and Galatians. Um, I will concentrate a little bit more on Romans 8, but if I can, I'm, I'm going to try and skim through Romans a bit a bit quicker, because we, we have dealt with Galatians, really. And there's nothing remarkably new to bring up here. So he start, he's got this video, The Romans uh, Road to Salvation is a Lie Straight from Hell, and uh, you may be familiar that a lot of people use the, the Romans Road, as it's called, uh, when, when preaching the gospel. It's not really a technique that I use, because I, I tend to focus on the certain points that I'm getting across. Um, if you see my video, The Simple Way to Heaven, in a nutshell, that, that's how I'd explain to somebody. Start by explaining they're a sinner, then explaining that Jesus died from, then explaining they receive it by faith, whoever believes, and then I explain the chastisement of believers and what happens if a Christian sins after they've believed, just just to help clarify that with people. Although that last bit is, is not so much about the gospel of salvation itself, it just helps to clear misunderstandings and objections people might have to the gospel. So, um, as you can imagine, you see, when you see Romans Road, in my head, I just imagine, well, someone starts with roughly what happened in chapter one, then you go to chapter two and chapter three. So, you know, there's these reprobates, uh, you, you know, you judge, but then, uh, you know, it's justification by faith and so on and so on and so on. So I imagine it kind of flowing that way. But naturally, as we expect Epiusion to do that, that's not how he reads the Bible. He starts with Romans 16, which is like getting towards the end of the book. Then, uh, well, there's a reference from Peter, which is not in Romans, so I'll just skip that one. But then he goes to Romans 6, then he goes back a chapter to Romans 5, then he's going to Romans 10, and then uh, he's going to Romans 8, and then he's, uh, see where else he goes with this. He, see, he's just going in like a really random order, and then we're going back to Romans 3, so it's just like forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Well, well that's not how Paul wrote the letter. He, he, again, you can't just read it like a normal letter. He has, to, he has to flip and read the Bible like that, because that's the only way he, his gospel can make any remote sense whatsoever. So uh, there you go. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to just briefly talk you really quickly through the first seven chapters of Romans, and then we'll focus on chapter eight. And then there's something else I want to pluck out from a later chapter about the issue of uh, the branches um, being being rooted or plucked out, um, because that will then tie in with uh, what I'm, when I'm going to start talking about John 15. So let, let's just uh, get through this. So Romans 1, we work our way down. Paul does his introduction. It's to all that be of Rome. So it's addressed to saints, Christians, believers, uh, here, there, and everywhere in, in Rome. Okay. Um, Further down, he's then, although he's talking to saved people, you might argue, he's already talking to the saints. He does obviously in this epistle deal extensively with gospel related issues. Now, so often on my channel, I've often pointed out like, well, look, this book isn't written to deal with eternal life, but we know that from what Paul's writing in Romans, it's a generally gospel themed uh, letter. So we, we can't just say it's addressed to saved people. Therefore, it's not relevant to, to the gospel in this case because it seems to be what he's intentionally uh, writing about as, as he starts to introduce here um, in, in 15 and 16. And he also says, uh, I am ready to preach the gospel to you, are at Rome. So that, that might mean that uh, for, we, we don't obviously know all the background behind that, but you know, there were still some Romans, maybe it was quite a young fellowship of people. So there's a lot of people that still need to understand the gospel and Paul needs to clarify a few a few things um, so that they don't end up with what what happened to the Galatians where, where false Judaizers were coming in essentially. So, um, you know, it, perhaps it, it was just a bit, perhaps a younger congregation, perhaps for all we know. Uh, so therein is the righteousness of God, verse 17, revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So just in case there's any verses that Epiusion wants to pluck out about works for heaven is uh, started it fairly early in, in his book there the just shall live by faith case closed that's what paul said um for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness and i want you to look carefully at some of the what what exactly paul's saying in some of these verses that i've highlighted here so the wrath of god is revealed against all ungodliness which yeah you could say is sin fine and unrighteousness of men again fine but there, there's a specific uh, caveat here a specific thing about these men it's they hold the truth in unrighteousness so it's not just well they reject the truth because they've kind of got their own truth you know they've got their own belief they they actually hold the truth but they hold it in unrighteousness. Okay, very important that you understand that because of some obey words that are going to come out in chapter two that, that Epiusio will try and manipulate you with. 
So keep reading that. I've, uh, he then goes on to flip it. So we've, we've got us that were, you know, the, the, the righteous that he's addressed, his letter to those that live by faith. But we then flip that and we're now talking about those who hold the truth and unrighteousness. The, the, and this is what you might call the reprobate mind as he goes on to explain in this chapter. Um, so he then goes on to explain about these. Uh, reprobates that the invisible things have got a, a clearly displayed, uh, you know, they're, they're without excuse, essentially. They did know God. So when they knew God, it doesn't say they were saved, but they knew God glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. So these are not just a bunch of pagans who don't know anything about God. People who, who know about at least the God of the Bible and reject him. They, they hold the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness. Okay. And he does have to explain that again, there's this Jew and Greek thing going on here. So, you know, there could be a lot of Jews in this camp here that because they're Jewish, they think they hold the truth, but, but they hold it in unrighteousness. Okay. You'd go a bit further down and in verse 25, again, it's similar wording to what he used up here, that, that they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, now he says they've changed the truth of God into a lie. So it's not just that, again, it's not just that they reject the truth. They just don't like the truth. They've got their own truth and they just believe different things. No, they've changed the truth of God into a lie. Okay, so they took the truth and changed it and hold it in unrighteousness. Very, very important you understand that because of some of the language that's going to come out in the next chapter. All right, so uh, the rest of this chapter is just explaining uh, these reprobates. They, they do all of these wicked, evil things and, and the judgment of God is against them because they do those wicked things. All right, so following all the things that he's described about about the reprobate mind and what they do, he then says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, o man whosoever that thou art. So, again, this is some context that you, you kind of miss from modern Bibles because they don't use the these and the thous, but, you know, it, it does have the whosoever there just in case. So he's not writing to all of the Romans and say, well, if all you Romans are judging these people and you're doing these same things, this, this isn't about the Romans as a, as a group. It's not even necessarily about one specific trouble causer within the Romans, as 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 we saw what was was the case in Galatians, because this is just whosoever you are. So this is just anybody to whom any individual person to whom this applies. So that's very similar to when when he said in Galatians, he that uh, lives by the flesh or he that lives by the spirit. It's just he whoever he is or, or you whoever you are. Okay. So this is a hypothetical. Uh, question in essentially or well point that he's making somewhat somewhat rhetorical so then uh think think you this oh man that judges them which do such things so this is someone who's judging other people as if they do all these wicked things but then he points to that person whoever is thinking that and saying do you do the same and, and do you think that you shall escape the judgment of god okay so Again, they want to make that all about works, but we've already seen that the just shall live by faith. He already explained that in chapter one, just in case you missed it. So again, this is not an individual reclaiming or keeping his salvation. It's just if you're judging them by the evil works that they do, if if you do those things, you are yourself subject to the, to the judgment of God because you do those same things while you're pointing the finger at everybody else. OK, and then he and then he says uh, he extends his his rhetorical question or do you despise the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long suffering not knowing that the goodness of god leads you to repentance so it's not that well you've turned from all your sins and you've laid down the drink and, and you're not doing all of these things which you judge other people no it's the goodness of god that leads you to repentance and, it, and again epiusion always makes that about repentance from all of your sins but it doesn't say of sins it just says repentance and it's the noun so it's the state of repentance the goodness of god leads you whoever you are to repentance okay it's not your obedience it's the goodness of god okay and that makes perfect sense if it's just whosoever believe and it doesn't make sense if you've got to play some part in it and then uh, but then he says again it's this hypothetical person that he's addressing here to, to whomever this would apply but after your hardness and impenitent heart treasure up against yourself wrath against the day uh, of wrath and the revelation of the righteous uh, judgment of God, who will render every man according to his deeds. And again, they'll point that verse and they'll see, well, there it is. Well, you know, because it says deeds, you'll, you'll be judged by deeds, not by faith. But again, keep reading, okay? This hasn't yet addressed whether a man actually believes the gospel. It's just a man who judges other people 
while he himself does this same thing. And actually, if if, you, if you're reading your Bible, your New Testament in order, you would have read the Gospel of John before you got to Romans, and you would have seen that in John chapter 8 specifically, I've done a video on John 8 before, that Jesus was addressing Jews who they thought they were in bondage to no man, they thought they were without sin. Jesus was telling them otherwise. Okay, so having that background would, would kind of explain what, what Paul's really talking about here as well. So then uh, he'll render every man according to his deeds or his works. Well, well, just keep reading. Okay, don't stop there. So to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honour and immortality, eternal life. So this is a verse where um, Epiusium takes that to, to mean that you've got to be doing works to, for your eternal life. So in his video, Absolute Death Blow to, to the Grace Swiss, we, we've looked at this video before. This is where he, about 16 minutes 44 in, this is where he points out that verse. And so he's arguing that God shows no partiality. So if he's going to judge, what he's taking that verse to mean there is that if God's going to judge unsaved people by their works, presumably he's going to judge saved or believers by their works as well. We're, we're, we'll get to that in a moment, but let, let's just focus on what's wrong with the way that he's quoting this verse about about um, seeking glory on it. And, and, and again, he thinks this is well-doing and patience. Okay, well, again, let's look at what the verse actually says. It's to them who are patient, continuance, in, in well-doing. And when it says well-doing, it's not really giving you any clarification as to what the well-doing is being do done, okay? It just says they, they continue in their well-doing, whatever that happens to be. Well, what is it about them? It's that they seek for glory, honour, and immortality, eternal life. So it's not that they're earning eternal life. It's not that they're working for eternal life. It's not that they have eternal life because they have done well. It's they're, they're seeking for glory, they're seeking for honour, they're seeking for immortality. And Jesus himself said, ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find. Okay, if somebody wants it on and they want to seek it, they they can have it. Okay, so that, that's all you can really take out of that verse. That you, you cannot make work salvation out of that one tiny little verse and just completely ignore everything else that Paul is going to explain in great detail in this book about how we're justified unto righteousness by faith without works okay so again it's so easy to just take a verse out well it does say seek it doesn't say earn or work they seek it okay that's why it's given on to them what's the problem well if we read the next verse with the other lot well they're contentious they do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath so again Epiusion takes words like obey that's that's what he does here he takes these obeying words and he see you've got to obey the commandments of jesus and you've got to be following this new testament law well no he doesn't say obey the law or obey the christ law or the new testament law or the love law or it says obey the truth well what does he mean obey truth or 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 they they obey unrighteousness rather well we saw it from chapter one they've changed the truth of god into a lie okay they hold the truth in unrighteousness okay so it's not that they're doing all of these naughty things and you know they're doing too many naughty things but they are believers but you know they just won't stop doing these naughty things for some reason they hold the truth but they hold it in unrighteousness they've changed the truth of god into a lie and actually epiusio and apologetics and people like him are part of that camp because when i when i if i'm giving the gospel to somebody I can use the words of the Bible that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I just use the words that Jesus used. I don't have to dress it up and tart it up and rephrase it. I just quote those verses. So there you go. It's, it's whosoever believes. That's what it says. People like Epiusion and, and himself, what they have to tell you is, repent of your sins to be saved. Funny, because when I open my Bible, there is no verse that says that verbatim. Now, there are verses that they'll try and turn and twist to make it say that, but there's no verbatim verse that says, repent of your sins. Or here's another one. How about these people who say, you must surrender your life to Jesus and make him the Lord of your life. Well, again, can we have a chapter and verse that says that verbatim? No. Yeah, you, you can point to a verse that you want to twist to make it say that, but you haven't got a verbatim verse. You see, when I believe that salvation is by faith, when and I believe that it's just by believing. I've got verbatim verses that say those things. You haven't got verbatim verses that say, surrender your life to Christ or repent of your sins. Because you see, 
for people like Epiusio, when they have a false gospel, they can't just quote the words of Jesus. They've got to add their own words and try and dress it up and rephrase what the Bible actually says to make it say what their gospel says. Why? Because they, they do hold the truth. They have the Bible. They know where those verses are, but they've changed it. Oh, oh well, you need to repent of your sins. Oh, well, you need to surrender your, your life to Christ. No, it's it's while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, as, as Romans, Romans will actually explain later. Okay, Christ died for us. We don't surrender our life to Christ when we were dead in sin. That makes no sense. You don't turn from all of your sins to be saved because it just says repent, and it says repent and believe the gospel. It's perfectly consistent with John's gospel, which didn't tell you to turn from your sins. So if we have to turn from our sins to be saved, you've got to tell Jesus why he preached a false gospel to multiple people in John's gospel okay so that's what it means there by obey on righteousness they they know what the truth is but they don't obey it they change the truth that's the problem that's what it means by obey the truth if you believe you have to surrender your life to Christ to be saved you're not obeying the truth if you believe you have to do the works of the law or some kind of big long list of works to be saved you are not obeying the truth you've changed the truth into a lie because the truth says whosoever believeth in him. The truth says, by grace through faith, not of works. That's what the truth says, folks. Deal with it. Okay, so uh, there's that. Get that off my chest. And then uh, again, he's explaining there's this Jew first, and then there's the Gentile business, because the Jews, they have the word of God. They've had the light shed on them more than any other nation on the planet at that particular time. So, you know, they're the ones that are going to be judged first, essentially, according, you know, to the standard of God. So, uh, and again, there's this verse where it says, glory, honor, peace to every man that works good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, let's just keep reading. Let's just not pluck that verse out of context and say, well, see, see there it is, work to you wait heaven. No, let's actually keep reading, get the whole context of what Paul is saying here. There's no respect of persons with God. And, and this is the one where um, it, it might say God shows no partiality or, or no favoritism in, in some translations. So what he argues in this video is that because God shows no partiality, if the unsaved, non-believing world is going to be judged by their works, then the saved believers will also be judged by their works by the exact same measure, and so they can go to hell just as much as the non-believer can because of the fact that of these works. Okay, because why? What? What's the logic? Well, it's apparently because God is not a respecter of persons or shows no favoritism. But the thing is about that, though, folks, is that God himself said that if you believe you shall not die, you shall have life everlasting. So if, 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 if you're justified by faith without works and you're going to heaven based on what you believe, not because of what you do, that's not God showing favoritism to you because it's God that set that standard. It's, it's not man that came up with, well, if we just believe, you know, God said whosoever believeth. It's, it's God that set that standard. So God is not respecting persons if he only accepts those who follow the gospel the way that he told him to follow. So that's where that argument fall, falls apart immediately. So for as many as have sinned, and that's again, past tense have sinned up to now. It's not whether they, it's not really dealing with keeping on sinning or do sin, but they have sinned without the law shall perish without the law, but have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So, well, guess what? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He explains that, um, in, in the next, you know, later in this, this letter. So it says here for the he for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And again, this is another verse where people are going to jump on that verse and make that you've got to obey the law to be saved. But what law is he talking about here? He's talking about Old Testament law, really, because he hasn't introduced any kind of new law here. He's not mentioned that subject. And Epiusion even said himself, well, we're not justified by the Old Testament law. That's what Paul is arguing about. Well, since he's just using the word law over and over again, and he continues to use the words law in all of the verses that Epiusion wants to say it's about Old Testament law, well, guess what? This is Old Testament law as well, okay? So you cannot pluck that verse and make it you've got to obey the law to be saved. You are an idiot if you believe that, because it goes against what Paul is about to explain as this book continues. Again, if you just keep reading. So yeah, if you want to be justified, by all means, be a doer of the law. But then uh, he already explained at the beginning of the chapter, you judge everybody else when you do the same things, whoever you are, okay? So that falls apart immediately because here's the problem. Nobody does the law. Okay. That's why that verse doesn't work for salvation. Now it could, if you did that, the problem is you don't do it folks. And if you've ever broken the law in the past, 
you you fall under that category it's as simple as that you can't say well now i'm obeying the law no you, because it's all have sinned without the law or have sinned in the law okay you have sinned period so then the gentiles which don't have the law they don't obviously know the law of god so they they're judged uh they still have conscience but they will be judged without the law as paul has previously explained whereas the jews will be judged by the law that's why again it's the jew first altar to the gentile i'm not going to explain that in massive detail now and then behold you are called a jew so this you whoever you are whosoever thou art that do this is still we're still on the thou okay we're still on this so what is primarily dealing with this chapter here is jewish people who rest in the law boast before god uh, and and they they're glorying in the flesh that but now they're they're confident in themselves that they're a guide to the blind and a light which to them they're in darkness they they boast in themselves that they're in, an instructor to the foolish and so on and so on and, and the truth of the law so the, the the hypothetical jewish man here is boasting about all of these things but again paul says a similar thing to uh in, in verse 21 and 22 that he explained at the beginning of the chapter okay that Okay, you you teach another not to do these things, but do you do these things? Well, uh, the thing is, we we know that everybody has done these things. Okay, all have sinned. Paul will explain that later in, in this epistle, not not long after this. Okay, so here's the problem: when Paul's saying earlier in this chapter, you know, works and deeds and all this kind of stuff, and you've got to do the law to be justified. You've got to work good. Okay, well, here is the problem: you're boasting in the law but you don't meet the requirements of the law okay and so the name of god is blasphemed among uh, in the among the gentiles through you as it is written circumcision profits nothing so again the this jew this man that paul's addressing hypothetical is making a big thing about circumcision and we all need to be circumcised well if, if you believe that you're a debtor to the whole law you've got to do the whole law but you don't meet the law as he's explaining here because do you do these same things well if you're honest you'll say yes here's the problem nobody obeys the law which is why obeying the law for salvation doesn't work this isn't complicated folks and so it, it's so easy to just take a verse and say well see there it is case closed epiusion wins again but if you just read the whole thing no he's completely wrong about it okay and he contradicts himself when he says that you're not justified by the old testament law you're justified by new testament law because we haven't got onto su such subject here so if he's just saying law 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 and he's predominantly dealing with somebody who is called a jew well guess what buddy old testament law so it's the doers of the law that shall be justified nobody does the laws so, so again work salvation crumbles like a house of cards here and so continuing where paul left off in chapter two because remember the the chapter numbers wouldn't have existed when paul wrote the letter so we're just carrying on the same thought he then has to explain you know there were some that did not believe but it didn't make the faith of god without effect um uh, that you, and then look what it says here that you might be justified in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged so okay well we're judged by works as he explained in the previous chapter fine but then you might overcome and he's going to explain how you overcome okay because here's the problem is he's going to explain all of this here there's none that does good none is righteous nobody meets the requirements of the law now Epiusion tries to take this where it says there's none righteous no not one and he says stop applying this to people who are believers this is before we believed but the thing is we're still on the topic of old testament law because he's just invented this new testament law that we have to suddenly obey it's just not there folks okay we're just carrying on with the same law that paul's been talking about you you have to do the law to be justified by it but nobody does that's the point that he's explaining here okay so that's why uh, the deeds of the law no flesh shall be justified in god's sight because all it does is the law just brings knowledge of your sin okay so the righteousness of god is by faith and it's all of them that believe so you can't then say well you're you're telling that you're saying that god has special respect if he lets all of these believers into heaven when you know they haven't tidied up their life yet well the thing is the righteousness of god is by faith that's 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 god's issue it's not mine so it's not respect of persons that's the standard that god plays so you either meet that standard or you don't and if god's not a respecter of persons well work salvation see ya not gonna work so uh and then again all have sinned come short of the glory of god justified freely by his grace so again free justification so you can't say it's by works because then it's not free it's not his grace um and then uh 
it's explaining that Jesus is the justifier. So, you know, you believe in him, that's your justification. Well, justification onto what? Well, it's onto righteousness, as Romans 3 explains and Romans 4 explains. And we're not even going to have to look at Romans 4 in any great detail because we already dealt with that when we dealt with James chapter 2, which is a different type of justification because James wasn't talking about being justified by the law. Uh, so, sorry, justified for righteousness by the law. So that's, I'm skimming through Romans 3 uh, pretty quickly there. Uh, Romans 4, we've uh, again already addressed that with James 2, so we, we can just uh, uh, carry on. So then we get to Romans 5, continuing on the same theme and just taking an absolute machine gun to work salvation. So we're justified by faith. Well, now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, these conditional security folk, they don't have any peace because their salvation on any given day is only as good as their own opinion of their own obedience. Uh, and so by whom we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we rejoice, we have hope in the glory of God because it's by faith into this grace. Okay, this is all the grace, it's all the faith. Okay, it's not you turned from your sins, it's faith and it's grace. That's what we rejoice in the hope. Okay, and here it is. There is the golden one. God commended his love uh, toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were yet sinners, we repented of all of our sins and then Christ died for us, you know, because it's always repent of your sins first, then it's believe for some weird reason when they preach that gospel. Nope. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how he solved the sin problem. He, you didn't solve it by your turning from all of your sins. Christ died for you. You don't surrender your life to Christ to be saved. That is the stupidest gospel ever. Okay. Christ died for us. That's what the real gospel says. And so now being justified by his blood. So it's Christ's blood, the covering for sin. We looked at all that. Hebrews 10 stuff, we shall be saved. There's a definite one for you. It's not should be saved, might be saved, shall be saved. There's a definite. So uh, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So you want to point to Romans 2 with all of those little verses that you nitpicked about how we're going to be judged according to our works and we've got to be doing well. Well, you know, funny because we'll be saved from wrath through him, not through our suddenly doing good works. So yes, God will judge according to works, but we shall be saved from wrath through him. There you go. Perfectly simple. When you just keep reading Paul's letter and just take it in the entirety of what it says. And so uh, he explains a few more points here. Um, for he is a good one for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And what did he say in Galatians? You are not under the law. So if you're not under the law, sin is not imputed. Because you see, what happens is when, when you have certain verses in the Bible about how we're set free from sin, and Epiusione always makes that about how you've got to stop sinning. But that's not him making you free from sin. That's just you turning from your own sins. So that, that doesn't even work anyway. But here it is. Sin is not imputed. Okay. Because you're not under the law. Now, if you sin, the chastisement of believers explains that. We already looked at that all the way back in Hebrews. We already sorted that out. We don't need to go back over old ground. So if you still sin, then that deals with that issue. But as far as righteousness is concerned, if you're not under the law, no sin can be imputed because there's there's no law to impute you with. Okay, that's the premise of the argument here. And again, there's that liberty that he was talking about in Galatians. And here it is again, for not as the uh, offence, but is the free gift. Well, you can't work for something that's a free gift. That doesn't work. Either it's a free gift or it's not. It's as simple as that. Uh, and so the fence of one many be dead, but much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man. It's not by you turning from your sins. It's by one man, Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ did has abounded to many. OK, and not as it was by one that sinned. So is the gift of the judgment was of one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offences onto justification. Look at that. Many offences, the free gift onto justification. So it's the free gift that covers your many offences. It's not you turning from your sins that covers your many offences. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of the life. So he's just saying the same thing worded slightly differently. It's Christ that came into the world and he dealt with your sin. He's the justification unto life. Your filthy rags, your works, your obedience, I don't care how many sins you've turned from, that's not your justification unto life because it's what Christ did and it's the free gift that he, he gave. Case closed, okay? And James is not talking about these concepts because it's a different kind of justification. And here's the key one. Get this. If you, if you, if you still want to harp on this old, boring, repent of your sins gospel, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of 
one shall many be made righteous. Oh, well, you need to be turned from your sins to be righteous. No, it's the obedience of one. And you're not that one. Jesus Christ is that one. Get over it. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So again, it's the grace that persists your eternal life. It's the grace that keeps your righteousness going. It's not your perpetual repentance that keeps your eternal life ongoing here, folks. It's grace. It's faith. And it would, it would just it, it, he can say it as many times as he wants. Epiusion just won't get it. Well, James too. What you mean that one verse about faith being dead? You've got one verse and we've got entire chapters and you want to just take that one verse and completely redo these chapters instead of re-examining that one verse in light of all of these chapters. Yeah, that verse, of course. Yeah. So uh, keep plowing through Romans. We'll slow down just a little bit for Romans 6 and 7. Uh, but Paul does ask this hypothetical question. Shall we sin that grace may abound? Now, they'll often take that verse and they'll, you know, because they want to say again, well, Paul did say this, so then you can't say that, you know, you can't turn from your sins. You must be, you know, completely turned from all of your sins because Paul says here, shall we sin? God forbid, let's not do it. Well, that's fine. But the thing is, though, yes, we agree with that. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That That's Paul's argument. We We shouldn't just continue in sin just because grace abounds. But that doesn't change the hypothetical question. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, if grace doesn't abound where sin abounds, then the question makes no sense. So yes, we shouldn't continue in sin, but that doesn't change the fact that grace abounds, though. Okay, very important that you understand that, that going into this. So he explains, well, you were dead to sin. You were baptised into Jesus' death, so buried with him in baptism. Christ was raised up from the dead, and so net we should walk in newness of life. Why? Because Christ has been raised from the dead. And in red there, he gives he gives more reasoning as to why he's saying this. You see, he doesn't say anywhere here that you need to do this to maintain your salvation. He's giving you reasons why he's telling you to do this. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. We're on to collective language now because we've got we and we've also got you plural. We're not, we're not dealing with the thee and the thou that we had in Romans chapter 2. So then he explains that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. Now you're, you're still in this body, okay? But uh, he, he's arguing we, we should not serve sin because we, we should reckon ourselves dead to sin. Now, at the moment, it, it perhaps doesn't make a lot of sense yet what he's talking about in Romans 6. He explains it more in Romans 7. But the point that Paul's going to get across to you in throughout Romans 6 and 7 is that you, you've got two issues here. You've got the flesh and you've got the spirit, okay? Now, what you must understand is that even if you're saved, your flesh is still dead okay you, you are not now in a glorified state all of a sudden you're still in dead flesh the flesh has been crucified with him so you're still getting older you're still dying and this flesh still has a sinful nature now again we delved into this when we dealt with galatians so the premise of paul's argument here is that well now that you're saved we have life so we, we have that hope of eternal life as, as paul's been explaining up to now we we have a hope but we are still in this sinful flesh. So then what do we do? Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may about? Well, no. What we should do is we should reckon ourselves dead to sin. So the, the old man is crucified. Now, if we're dead in Christ, we, we believe. We, we don't work. We believe that we shall also live with him. So knowing that Christ ra uh, is raised from the dead, uh, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Okay. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he lives, he lives unto God. And so likewise, so just as Christ was raised unto life and death has no more hold on him, you're in that same camp. Death has no more hold on you. Now, now you're still in a body of death, but death has no more hold on you. OK, so again, this is why uh, conditional security doesn't really work. But the point that is getting across to you is that, yes, you're in sinful flesh, but because you now have this spirit, you should reckon yourselves to be dead. So it's as if you're you're trying to live out as if you your body was already dead, okay? Because once your body dies, your your spirit is not bound to sinful flesh anymore. And in your future resurrected body, you won't have a, a flesh that wants to sin anymore. But we're still in that state of, of quandary at the moment, okay? We, we've got the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit lusting against it. We've got that problem now, okay? We won't have the problem in the future, but we have it now. So the point of what he's trying to get across to you 
you here is, even though you're in sinful flesh, reckon as if it were dead. Okay, so just assume that it was already dead, so that you then crucify the flesh, and you don't just continue on sinning, because that's what your body wants to do. But you, sh you should imagine it as if your body is already dead, even though technically it's not yet. Okay, so then that's why he says, don't yield your members unto righteousness but yield yourselves unto god okay sin shall shall not have dominion over you why because you're not under law but under grace okay so again this is all explaining what why he's telling you these things so when jesus christ said I, the, the son shall make you free indeed it doesn't make you free from ever wanting to sin that you will never sin again that's not the argument but it, sin won't have dominion over you anymore. You now have a spirit that can wrestle against the flesh. And you now have the hope of life everlasting. Okay. Now then he asks a very similar question in verse 15 that he asked at the beginning of the chapter. Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? No, we shouldn't. God forbid. May it never be. Uh, and, th and then he says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin and death or of obedience unto righteousness. Well, this is a verse that people will take and they'll make that about your life now that if if you're still struggling with sin and you haven't successfully turned from all of your sins yet you're still serving unrighteousness and there's a similar thing in john chapter 8 uh, that they take as well about being being the servant of sin um is it john chapter 8 or one joy it's one or i think it might be both is that there's something about he could commit sin is a servant of sin but again keep reading but god be thanked that you were the servants of sin but you have obeyed. Well, you have obeyed the law, you have obeyed the commandments, you have obeyed all the things that we told you to do. Well, no, you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, okay? So it's the it's the doctrine that set them free. They obeyed from their heart, which is really synonymous with believing, because it's in the heart, the form of doctrine. Well, how do you obey doctrine? Well, you have to believe the right doctrine, okay? Uh, because it, it's doctrine, it's not commandments. Um, so, we, and we already saw that, you know, much earlier in Romans, that we've got the truth, and then we've got those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. We want to hold the truth in righteousness. So then, being made free from sin, and again, well, what is it here? It's it's the, the death of sin, the, the consequences of sin. Sin reigning over you, that's what you're made free from. You became, past tense, the servants of righteousness. Now, again, why is he telling these things? And if, but think about this, just think this through, okay? If they were the servants of sin, but then they became servants of righteousness. That that happened in the past. Why does he need to tell them this about not sinning so that they're under grace? Because he's not dealing with losing salvation. That's not even what he talks about, really. It's it's because he, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Okay. So even as you have yielded your members to uncleanness and from uh, to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now now yield your members servants to righteousness and holiness. Sorry, I think there's a lot of traffic going by at the moment. So you were servants of sin. You were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things where you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now being made, now being made free from sin. So again, don't just read there and stop there about the, the death thing. Keep reading. Now being made free from sin and become the servants of God. Now you have now your fruit onto holiness and the end everlasting life. It's not you will get your fruit. You must work your fruit. You have your fruit. But we know that the wages of sin is death, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And notice the opposites. The opposite, well, there's the sin, that's the cause of the death, but what's the opposite? It's not not sinning, it's the gift of God. So the opposite of the sin is the gift of God. It's not repenting from sin, that's not the opposite of sin. The gift of God is the opposite of sin. So again, it's all what Christ has done, it's all what God has done. So the point that Paul's getting here is, yes, you are saved, yes, you are under grace, don't use that as an excuse to sin, though. That's the point that he's getting across, okay? So that, that you know, you, you, again, you can't make that about losing salvation. It's just it's not what he's talking about. One of the premises here about being freed from sin is that death has no more dominion. You see, if you need to be careful that you don't sin because you might lose your salvation, but there's a part of you that wants to sin still, you can't really say that you're freed from sin, okay? And you can't even say that God has freed you from sin because really it's your works that are freeing you from your sin, not God's grace, okay? But it's God that freed you from your sin. That do that doesn't, at the moment, take away your your fleshly want to sin. The flesh is still there, which is the whole point of why he's trying to get this chapter across to you. But the consequences, the dominion of sin, the uh, the judgment of sin, the law of sin, that's what you're freed from, because that's what he's been arguing quite consistently in his chapters up to now, okay?
Now then, Romans 7, really helpful for you because it all the stuff that you didn't quite understand about Romans 6, Romans 7 sorts it all out. So, do you not know, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Well, he's already explained that this group, they're not under the law, okay? They're under grace. So, uh, you know, don't take that out of context. But again, this body, still subject to the law, it's still dying because of its sins, okay? Uh, you are also, it goes on to further explain, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So again, yeah, the law has uh, dominion as long as a man lives, but you are already dead to the law, married to another. Okay, well, for what reason? Well, we were, past tense, in the flesh, the motions of his sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth death. So we, we were under that condition, bringing forth death. But again, now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of the spirit and not, not the oldness of the letter. Okay, so um, he'll clarify a bit later about what exactly uh, that means if we just keep progressing through the chapter. So he explains some things about how uh, the law exposed his sin, that he realised it was sin because of, of the law, but he still has the flesh that wants to do those things. We know that the law is spiritual, but he says, I am carnal, present tense, sold under sin. And the reason I make a show of highlighting that is that a lot of people want to take this and say, well, it's just when Paul was mentioning when he was a Pharisee, you know, or he's talking about before he got saved. But that doesn't really fit the words that Paul's been talking about. He's not mentioned his pharisaical life here. It's just not part of it. People just invent that because they don't want to acknowledge what this chapter says. He is carnal, sold under sin, and he goes on to explain why. Okay, for I uh, that which I do I allow not, for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that I do. So he knows he should be doing this, and he, ha he knows he shouldn't be doing this, but he's doing this instead of that. That's kind of what he's saying there in a nutshell. So if then I do that which is uh, I would not, I consent that the law is good. So this is what he's consenting to here. It's not that we obey the law to be saved, but he consents that the law is good. Okay, and, and the law is good. Okay, yes, we're not under the law, but the law is good, and it is spiritual. Okay. And now then, it, this, this is a key point here. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So all of this stuff where he's doing what he should not be doing, he's doing what he would allow not, that's his flesh still doing those things. The sin that dwells in him is doing that, not he himself. So it doesn't affect his salvation, it doesn't take away salvation. It's his sinful flesh that, that, wants, that, that is doing those things, the sin that dwells in him. Okay, for I know that that is in my flesh, that's in his flesh, dwells no good thing. Okay, for to will is present within me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would that I do. So, um, what, what this is kind of explaining is a bit like in Galatians, where he said the spirit is uh, against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. This is just a much more explained way of saying that same thing. Okay, it's a very similar theme, it's just in much more detail. Um, so then, uh, it, no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I then find a law that when I would do good, evil is still present within me. So he's still describing now, evil is present within me. Okay, now we reckon ourselves dead to sin, but evil is still present within me. He, he's trying to explain all of what he's explained to them in Romans 6. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So it's the inward man that delights in the law because the flesh has already failed the law the flesh can't obey the law the flesh doesn't even want to obey the law the flesh wants to do all the things that the law has said is wrong the inward inward man recognizes that the law is good the law is spiritual okay so he's seeing these these two uh sorts of things going on here these two laws in effect there's the law of his mind the 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 spirit his his new mind but then there's this still this law of sin this this body of captivity so that you can see again the, the spirit and the flesh wrestling against each other there um, and then he, he sort of exclaims it oh wretched man who shall be, deliver me from the body of this death okay and then watch what he says just as the finale in verse 25 so then with my mind i serve the law of god but with the flesh, the law of sin. So he still says that his flesh still follows the law of sin. Well, you've got to be free from all of your sin. You've got to turn. No, because the flesh still obeys the law of sin. So understand that any sins that you're struggling with as a Christian, that's your flesh that's struggling with that. It's the flesh that's still under that law of sin. The flesh is still that servant of sin, okay? It's your spirit that's born again. That's why Jesus said you must be born in spirit 
to be saved. That's what that means, okay? So it's got nothing to do with doing works to be saved. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's trying to explain the spirit in you is the aspect of you that doesn't sin and follows the law of God. It's the flesh in you that still disobeys the law and obeys the law of sin, okay? So now we're on to Romans 8, um, and I think a lot of what he says actually hangs on some of the verses in here. I just want to, I want to spend, I want to be a bit more careful about the text here. Uh, I'll, I'll start circling things, just, just pay close attention to exactly what Romans 8 says. And j again, just get this into your mind about how embarrassing this guy is, okay? I don't know how he takes himself seriously when he looks, I, I don't know. Remember that all the way ages ago, we, we looked at where he said, well, we don't follow the Old Testament law, we follow a New Testament kind of a law, the law of love, and he was using Galatians to argue that, okay. Well, this video, this Romans Road thing, it's all about how, what verses can he pluck out of Romans to show you that you need to do works to be saved, right? Now, look what he says at 30 minutes, about 30 minutes in, he's explaining verse 4 here that it says the righteous requirement of the law is only fulfilled in those who are not walking according to the flesh but they're walking according to the spirit well has paul been talking about the the law of christ or some new testament law or some new law that's replaced the old law paul hasn't said anything like that okay so what law are we talking about here this is Old Testament law, okay? Mr. Well, we can't be saved by the Old Testament law. It's a New Testament law. And then you, in another video, he'll quote a verse that points to Old Testament law as an example of what we should be walking in to be saved. He contradicts himself left, right, and centre, and he chooses arguments, contradictory arguments, if and when it suits him to do so, okay? And it's like, if you don't see how blind this guy is, I've got no sympathy for you when you're burning in hell. Like, seriously, when, when you say, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you, I've got no sympathy if you're just going to make constant excuses for this guy and about how he's really a man of God, when he just contradicts himself all the time when it suits him to do so because he just changes the argument he keeps moving the goalpost to be to be saved and it, i'm sorry i'm getting so irate but it, it, it winds me up is what it does because it's like if you don't get that that shows he's a false prophet what else can i do for you like all, all of you sycophants that are part of his 1.57k subscribers what can i do for you if you don't see it it's just, it's right there in front of you this guy is a wicked devil who just contradicts himself and he changes the goalposts and you think you're going to get to heaven because you followed his advice like, like seriously give me a break okay so anyway let, let's just get on to the, the passage so now let's deal with Romans 8, and this is where we need to slow down a bit and look at the text more carefully than, than what we've skimmed through. Because a lot of what he's arguing from Romans here really hangs on verse 4 here. So uh, the bit that he likes to point out, his favourite bit to, to turn to in this uh, passage here, is the bit where it says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So let's just have a look at the transcript about half an hour and let, let's just see something that he, he points out. So about half an hour in, he's, he's pointing to verse 4 where it says the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in who? And then he, he continues the sentence hypothetically, but obviously he, he's, he's mocking the other position or rather, well, rebuking the other position in, in effect. So he's saying in those who just make a profession and believe in their heart and that's it. Well, obviously, that's not what the verse says. And so that, that's this point that he's attacking faith alone because he's saying uh, that's not what that verse says. It doesn't say the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in them that believe. Uh, but it, it's those who walk um, in after, the, you know, according to the spirit rather than um, according to the flesh. That, that's what he's pointing out there. Well, again, we come full circle round to this same problem that he, we, we had with the Galatians issue. OK. He tried to make this false distinction between New Testament law and Old Testament law. So then all the verses that you would point to in Romans 3, 4 and 5 and so on that were not justified by works of the law, he would say, well, that's Old Testament law. You need to be justified by New Testament law works. OK, and then this, these are the kind of verses that he's going to quote to. But when it says the righteous requirement of the law, well, he's already explained in the previous verse the law could was weakened by the flesh and could not do so that the law could not save you well then 
that's the context, Old Testament law. So then he wants to point to a verse about Old Testament law and say, well, you fulfill Old Testament law if you're walking in the spirit, and which he means do all of these works. So again, it just goes to show how he picks contradictory argument points if and when it suits him. When it suits him to quote a verse about fulfilling Old Testament law, uh, and he makes it about works, then he'll quote it. But then when you try and confront him with all these about how we're not justified by the law, oh, well, that's just, that's a different law. The, the rules have changed. He constantly moves the goalposts, folks. And, and if you're one of his 1.57k subscribers and, and you're listening to this now and you're seeing this and you just want to make excuses for this guy and you just want to say how he's really a man of God and he, he preaches the right gospel. Well, you know what? I don't know what else to do for you. I cannot do anything for you because you you are just refusing to see it okay you are refusing to see how he is moving the goalposts constantly okay and if you just take this in the overall flavor of what paul's actually saying it, it really isn't that complicated what he's saying here now i couldn't find in the transcript maybe i missed it but i couldn't find where he even mentions romans 7 in this entire video. So we go to Romans 8 in this video and we just get complete amnesia as to everything Paul's just been saying about this point, that his mind serves the law of God, but his flesh still serves the law of sin, okay? We've just got complete amnesia. You see, he doesn't address that. It just completely misses it. So then he can just once again take this completely out of context because the chapter numbers didn't exist when Paul wrote this letter. So we just carry on where we left off at Romans 7. Okay, so so let's have a look at the text and let's break down what's really going on here. All right. So starting at verse 1 then, it says that there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus uh, and it goes on saying the King James, it, it's comma, who walk not after the flesh and after the spirit. And after the uh, Bible that, in, in the Bible that Epiusion uses, the English shoddy version, that, that bit isn't there. But it is obviously uh, repeated there in, in verse 4 anyway. So he, he still uses uses that, obviously. Now, um, when it says in Christ Jesus, so this is one of his proof texts about how you can lose salvation because, you know, it's no condemnation to them that it in Christ Jesus, you've got to stay in, you know, you can't veer off the path or, or this, that and the other. But the thing is with this verse, it's one dimensional okay it really only addresses one dimension there's no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus this doesn't delve into the issue of them which are not in christ jesus or them that are in no longer christ jesus okay they were and then they stopped it's just not addressed here so it's not relevant okay this is not a proof text for losing salvation because we only have a one-dimensional verse here Okay, well, who are they that are in Christ Jesus? Well, Paul's already explained this. We're justified by faith, it's one man's obedience. Do you believe that Jesus, Jesus' obedience has delivered you from sin and death? You either believe that or you don't. Okay, he doesn't believe that, by the way, Abusion, because he thinks he's got to mix some of his own filthy works in there. So what does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? Paul's already explained that. Okay, we're justified for righteousness by faith. It's by one man's obedience. Okay, case closed. So then he, he talks about the two laws here. And, and again, remember that this is continuing more or less the same theme that he left behind from uh, Romans 7. So the law of the spirit of life uh, has made me well, it now this is where when he says the law of the spirit of life in christ people like epusian want to make that about all of jesus commandments but the thing is we, we haven't got any detailed teaching about what this law of the spirit of life even is okay all we can do is contrast it with whatever the whatever its opposite is well its opposite is the law of sin and death and, and this is what we've been made free from so the law of sin and death old testament law the, there's all these laws if you do this that there might be a death penalty in a literal sense for that or uh, you know the wages of sin is death you might think of or you might you know there's so many old testament laws where it said the soul that does these things shall be cut off from his people and stuff like that so we know that the law the old testament law it, it points out our sin as uh, Romans 7 already told us that it did and so as Paul said the commandment brings forth death so because we have sinned or do sin you know have do whatever it, it brings forth death that law okay but we have been made free from that law okay we we are free from that law so whatever the spirit the law of the spirit of life in christ is it's something that sets us free from that law well again this has already been explained in romans okay 
justified by faith. Though our mind serves the spirit, uh, the law of God, but our flesh still so, so serves the law of sin. Okay, that's that's already been explained. So let's just not read Romans eight like we just had complete amnesia about chapter seven. Okay, and then so. When we've got two laws, we've got this law and then we've got this law. That's obviously two different laws there. But then in verse 3, he just says, the law. Okay, well, then it raises the question, which law? Do you mean the law of the spirit of life or do you mean the law of sin and death? Well, if he doesn't explain it either way, the rest of this verse then tells you what law we're talking about. And so we just carry that forward into verse 4. Okay, so the law could not do, well, what could it not do? Uh, it was weak through the flesh, God sending forth uh, his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, so there it is. Again, we're, we're dealing with Old Testament law, we're dealing with the law of sin and death. So how, how did Christ resolve that? Well, he condemned sin in the flesh, okay? And again, this has already been explained by Romans. We have been crucified with him, he was crucified, his bodily death dealt with the sin issue but now he's resurrected so it's the same for believers the law of sin and death still has hold on our flesh okay your body is again your body is still dying your body is still condemned that's why you're not in a glorified state yet that's why you weren't carried up in a whirlwind to heaven as soon as you got saved okay your body is still subject to the law law of sin and death but because christ has condemned this this is why you're now subject to the law of the spirit of life in other words you're free from the law of sin and death it, it really is that simple it, it doesn't get any more complicated than that you see epiusium wants to make this really complicated but you know he just perverts the simplicity that's in christ because it's really not complicated at all and we, we've already been seeing everything that paul's been saying up to now it's christ's obedience that deals with the sin issue not your obedience so then, the righteousness of the law, well, what law? Well, we just carry on where we left off from verse 3, because he's not saying the righteousness of the law of the spirit of life, he's just saying the law. So, according to verse 3, and what verse 3 described about the law, we're still on the law of sin and death, okay? And so, what Paul's argument point here is, what he's just been saying in, in verse 3, the law of sin and death, the Old Testament law, that could not bring you life. Okay, because it applies to your flesh, the, the law applies to your flesh, but you can't meet the requirements of that law. And so that's why, again, why was he pointing out to a hypothetical Jew back in Romans 2 about uh, about circumcision and all that kind of thing? Okay, because that's all part of the law, but that can't bring you life because you don't meet the requirements of the law because all have sinned. Already been explained. Okay, so because you've broken that law, that's why it could not do. OK, it just you, you can obey the law all you want. You know, you can love your neighbours yourself, this, that and the other. But you've already failed the law. You cannot meet the righteous requirements of the law. So that's why God sent his son. OK, so then the righteous requirement of that law, the law of sin and death, might be fulfilled, fulfilled in who? Well, it's in us. And notice, because again, Epiusium wants to make this about you. You've got to be walking after the spirit or you're not saved or you're not meeting the law this isn't about you personally okay this is us this is collectively the saints so we the saints well what is it about us well we walk not after the flesh but after the spirit okay so that that's who us is we so all it's really getting at here is we are part of that gang we're not part of that other gang it's, it's got nothing to do with your personal walk okay this is this is collective language here so then, what is it about us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit? Because he, you see, he's trying to make it all about the commandments you follow. But Paul's already given us all of the argument points up to now. You see, there were there was the hypothetical Jew who boasted in his flesh about being circumcised and this, that and the other. So he was the one uh, walking in his flesh. And again, this is very similar language to what we see in uh, Galatians. Sorry, it's not it's not losing me here it's not drawing a line properly so this is very similar language to what he said in, in galatians really those that are walking after the flesh they think they will be justified by the law that the law applies to their flesh well the we're not under the law because our flesh has been crucified with christ he's condemned sin in the flesh as it, as it says right here so we're not subject to that law why well we have the faith we are justified for righteousness by faith it's by christ's obedience that we are justified so that's why we fall into this category here okay it's those who are uh, have their their sin covered by christ christ has cr crucified their their flesh for them okay his blood has dealt with all of that 
And so if you follow what Paul's been talking about, once again, that's the context here, just as it was in Galatians. It's got nothing to do with how obedient you think you are. And even if you think you're obedient and you're walking after the Spirit, well, congratulations. But you're still justified by works then. And since we're dealing with Old Testament law here, you obviously think you're justified by Old Testament law. So unfortunately, sorry to tell you, you fall in the circumcision camp if you actually believe that. Okay. Now, there is a question to be addressed here. Okay. Is that if it says that the righteousness of the law uh, might be fulfilled in us. Well, if we're not if we're not under that law, if we're not subject to that law, if that law can't bring us in, if we're under grace, how how can that be true? How can the righteousness of the law uh, might be fulfilled in us? Well, again, let's not have amnesia with all of the Romans chapters leading up to now, okay? First of all, we saw that it's one man's obedience, Christ. Well, we know that Christ is in believers, that he dwells in believers, okay? The, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And remember in Romans 7, Paul contrasted, in the inward man, in my mind, I delight in the law of God, okay? I, I'm In the mind, I serve the law of God. But in my flesh, the aspect of me that isn't born again, it still serves the law of sin and the body of death. And so if I sin, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells in me, because in his flesh dwells no good thing, Paul is arguing there. So, so there's your answer, okay? Your flesh does not fulfill the righteousness of the law. Your born-again spirit fulfills the righteousness of the law. And any sin that you do is condemned in the flesh, okay? But nevertheless, as Paul's been arguing, don't use that as an occasion to sin. Now, obviously, Epiusium will falsely accuse of as saying that it's okay to go around sinning, but his condemnation is just as per what we saw in Romans chapter 3, what he says in 3.8. So, you know, it's just a false accusation. Then Paul goes on to explain more or less the same thought from verse 4 in verse 5, that uh, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and then they that are of the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. So we've again, we've got two types of people and it's they, it's collective language. He's not really individualizing this. It's not whosoever or any man that is after the flesh. Okay, we're using collectivized language. So earlier, um, about 40 minutes ago, I pointed out that um, the, the first verse is one dimensional. Okay, it's, it's really those who are in Christ Jesus, that there's no prospect of falling away or those that are not. Then we get to two dimensional. So we've got those that are in the flesh and those that are in the spirit. And as we've seen throughout Romans and we've seen throughout Galatians, there's those who think that they're justified by works of the law, or you, you, know, you could say the circumcision group. And there's those whose righteousness is justified by faith. Okay, so they're the ones that are after the flesh or after the spirit, because that's how Paul has framed this. He hasn't framed this as how obedient you are. That's just people like Epiusion reading into the text what they want it to say. Okay, so then he goes on to explain that to be carnally minded is death. Okay, so, well, then what about... What about a person who's doing carnal things? Well, again, let's not have amnesia about what we just read in Romans 7. If we sin, if the body the body is still under sin, it's no longer I that does it, but the sin that dwells in me. Okay, but Paul did explain right at the end of chapter 7, his mind serves the law of Christ. And so the spirit in him is connected to his mind. It's not connected to his whole body. Okay, so the flesh still wants to sin, but the mind has been renewed. Okay, it's the mind there that knows. So someone might do carnal things, but still be spiritually minded. Okay, well, you just take the examples of the Bible. People like Abraham who sinned, people like David who sinned. They were spiritually minded. They understood that God's uh, righteousness was imputed onto them. They understood those things. They uh, believed the promises of God. So they had a righteous mind, but having still a body of death, they was they were they still did carnal things, even though they weren't carnally minded. Okay, so it's the, it's carnally minded that's death, and that's those who are in the flesh, those that think they're justified by the works of the law, those that think that uh, they will be justified by circumcision or whatever it is. They're the ones who are carnally minded because that's what carnally minded people think. So it's being spiritually minded that is uh, life uh, and also peace. It's not spiritual doing. It's people who are spiritually uh, minded. OK, so uh, that that's that's really what he's saying there. And so he just carries on that same thought because that the carnal mind is enmity against God, uh, for it is not subject to the law of God. And it's uh, it, but neither can it be. And so herein lies the problem. You see, the carnal mind 
you might say that you have to obey the works of the law to be saved, but then you you cannot be subject to the to the law because you can't obey it with your flesh. Therein lies the problem. So the law applies to your flesh, but those that are in the flesh are just completely powerless to please God. So that's, again, this is why works, salvation, works of the law, it just doesn't work, okay? Something to point out about, about being carnally minded is that um, Epiusion often makes it out like once saved, always saved, or faith alone, is this massive apostasy that's just sweeping through Christianity. And in his video about repentance, he said there are many false teachers out there teaching that repentance doesn't mean turning from sin. When I've got a 50-minute video of my on my channel of loads of famous preachers from all different flavors of Christianity, all saying that repentance means turn from sin. Okay, so they they're constantly trying to. This is what that's what carnally minded is because a lot of the things that he throws against faith load. Well, you're saying that if someone murders, they can still go to heaven. Yeah, that's what every unsaved person objects to when you try and give them the gospel. It's the same boring argument points because that's how carnally minded people think. They think they can obey the law to make their way to heaven okay and all you have to do is when you evangelized people you, you just ask why are you going to heaven well i think i'm a good person oh so it's got nothing to do with christ then oh well you know i have a relationship with christ you know i, I do this i do it. it's all i me I, myself me i do this i do that that's how unsaved people think that's what carnally minded is okay but the spiritually minded person says uh, no it's christ who did it all and actually once saved, always saved isn't some big massive apostasy sweeping across Christianity. Because outside of free grace, there's only really the Calvinists that believe it. And even then, it still works based because they will say that the saints will persevere in works often. Most Christian denominations believe that you can lose salvation. Okay, that's what the Catholics believe. That's what the Methodists believe. That's what the Seventh day Adventists believe. That's what the Mormons believe. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And on and on and on. And they all say, well, it's a free gift, but dot dot dot. Why? Well, it's quite simple. They are all carnally minded. So when Epiusium likes to throw all these objections and all, all this stuff and act like he's spiritual, no, you're just proving that you're carnally minded because you just ask the same boring questions that all carnally minded people have. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it's all that same kind of thing. It's just, it, it doesn't matter what your logic is about how if a person still gets to heaven when, if, they, if they've sinned, it's about what Christ said. And, and it's what the Bible says, they'll say if the Lord case closed. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that he's carnally minded, it doesn't work. He can sound as spiritual as he wants. And so then he gets to verse 9 and he says, but you are not in the flesh, okay? So uh, this is this is the plural ye, you, it's not the thou. So again, this is not about you personally, but you, the Romans who I'm writing to, you are not in the flesh, okay? But in the spirit, if so, be that the spirit of God uh, dwells in you okay so it's not well if you do these works if you're obeying your way to give another spirit of god dwells in you well how does that happen well jesus said you must be born again you must uh, you, you must be born in the spirit well how do you do that jesus well you just keep reading john chapter 3 and he goes on to explain whosoever believeth in me okay again you see how this is just not complicated at all folks and you see how people just read all of these things going into here that paul hasn't even argued up to now okay so that, that's the condition that the Spirit of God is in you. Okay, you just believe the Spirit of God is in you. And so, if that's the case, you are not in the flesh. Nevertheless, while you're under grace and not under the law, don't use that as an occasion to the flesh, as he has pointed out, okay? And so, that's that's all we're trying to say in free grace, folks. Like, yes, let's obey the things that Christ told us to do. Yes, let's turn from our sins. But not to be saved, though. And it's like... It, it, People like Epiusion and all these carnal minded people, they just cannot separate works from salvation. They just cannot do it. They can just cannot grasp that actually there are people who do believe in obedience, but not to be saved. That that just it must just blow his mind that people are out there like that. Okay. And if Christ be in you, oh you will never sin again. Well that's not really what he says. He says that the body is dead because of sin. Okay. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay. So again, righteous spirit dead body he paul has made this so clear up to now it's really not complicated folks he's just he's hammered this in so many times okay then we'll just briefly look at some points in, in a, the next few verses of so the spirit that raised jesus from the dead if, it, if if that same spirit dwells in you 
well, then the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells. But obviously that, that's a future event. It's shall also. So that, but that's, that's not manifested yet. Okay. And so that's why we're in this sort of state of flux, if you like, or state of quandary where we're, we're spiritually minded, but we still have a carnal body. So Paul's trying to encourage the Romans to live as if you were already in this state, to, to live as if you were already quickened. Okay. Even though your bodies themselves are not quickened, that's why you have to bring it under subjection and so on and so forth. And so if it says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Well, again, they want to make that about keeping the commandments, but we've already set what that means. You know, there were people that boasted about circumcision and boasted in their flesh. Okay. That, that they're the two types of people. And we've seen that we're not justified by the works of the law. We're justified by faith for righteousness. So that's how you live through the spirit. And in doing so, you mortify the deeds of the body. Okay. The body is dead because of sin, as he's just explained. Okay. He has just explained that. So uh, there you go. And then for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So what does it mean? What What does that mean then? Because, well, if it says you're led by the spirit, that's not about your walk and your obedience. That's about what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit is leading you. This doesn't address whether you're following the Spirit. It's just addressing whether you're being led by the Spirit. Okay. Now, whether you follow, that's obviously another conversation in of itself. But is the Spirit leading you? Well, if you if if it leads you, you are the sons of God. Well, well how do we know if the Spirit is is leading us? Well, what else do we know about the sons of God? Okay, well, we know from John's gospel that to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So those that believe on his name, those that have the faith, they're the ones who are led by the Spirit. Okay, if we just tie all of those sons of God verses together, you just get the same conclusion. So again, don't read words into Paul's writings that he didn't actually say. Okay. And then he goes on to explain about our adoption, but he, he doesn't really deal so much about sin so much as he deals about our present sufferings versus uh, things that will, will happen in the future, our, our future resurrection. And so uh, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God so that the creature is still waiting. We haven't fully manifested yet. OK, because, uh, you know, our, our mortal bodies have not yet been quickened. So um, that's probably all I'm going to say about Romans eight uh there's one more point that i'm going to address about romans and it's the the classic you can lose your salvation passages in in romans so there's a section from romans 11 that that people often use to, to teach that you can lose your salvation now in this video here proof one saved always saved is a lie he actually starts with john 15 well i'm going to cover that after romans because i'd like to cover that uh, but we'll we'll start with Romans 11 first, seen as we're on Romans anyway, because they're both out of this video, so uh, we can do one then the other. So about 13 minutes in, that's when he starts talking about Romans, because both Romans uh, 11 and John 15 deal with a very similar theme, just in slightly different contexts. So uh, in John 15, he was talking to his disciples, but uh, in Romans 11, it, it's about the, the Gentiles versus the Jews, but it's this same theme of branches being in together, but then being broken off or, or cast off, uh, whatever it might be. Okay, so similar themes, just used in slightly different context of, of conversation. So uh, let, let, let's have a look at that. Now, there's something very interesting here, that there's, there's something that technically he's kind of right about, but the way that he argues it is completely and utterly ridiculous. So people will confront him hypothetically and say that this, when it's saying you, he will cut off you, it's talking to the general Gentiles in general, or a whole group of people. But then he argues this as saying, but this makes no sense if God already cut off Israel. But Israel is a group of people. So no, that would make perfect sense in that regard. But he even says they were broken off. He doesn't say he were broken off. So how can you say, well, it makes no sense to say that this is talking about a group of people because he already cut off a group of people. It's like, what kind of ridiculous logic is that? That makes no sense. Now, there there is some truth, though, is that Paul actually speaks more individualistic here. Now, 
again, in the King James, you get the these and the thous. You don't get that in the ESV, okay? It just says you, so it could be you singular, it, it could be you plural. You, you wouldn't necessarily know if the context didn't make it clear. And the context here actually does make it look plural, because it, they were broken off, okay? But um, if you actually look at it in the concordance, it's second person singular, thou, okay? So it's the singular you, it's not, it's not the plural you. So, so Paul does actually make it individualistic. So I'm, I'm surprised he's right about that. It's just the way that he argues about it. It's just completely and utterly stupid. But, but there you go. And so then what, what he tops off Romans 11 by saying is that, well, okay, even if this were plural, you've still got other verses like how John the Baptist said that every tree that does not bear good fruit it is cut down and thrown into the fire. But he, here's the difference about that verse there, though, is that that one doesn't deal with branches in the same tree all right it says every tree that bears good fruit it's not all the branches in the same tree so it's really a very different uh thing that that um john the baptist would was actually saying in that verse and actually if you just look to the previous verse it kind of gives you a clue to this whole thing anyway think not to say among yourselves we have Abraham, our father. Now, if, if you look at John chapter 8, that's what Jesus dealt with a lot of Jews. who They thought they were in no bondage to any man because they were the seed of Abraham. But Jesus said, no, that's not going to give you a pass. You need to believe in me. It's not just enough to just be Jewish and a descendant of Abraham. That's not going to work. OK, so that that kind of helps you give a little bit of understanding as to what happens in Romans 11 then. So I'm going to be fairly quick with this, but look, look how he introduces the chapter here. I say then, has God cast away his people? Because remember, later in the chapter, it says that God has cut off Israel. OK, well, he says, God forbid. So God hasn't cut off or cast away, rather, his people. So the branches that are cut off then logically can't be his people. Otherwise, you would say God contradicts himself. Whatever God has cast away, so you can say, well, he's cut off and cast away the branches of Israel. He might even cut off you as the Gentiles. But his people, he has not cast away. Very important you understand that. So he's now here making a distinction between his people and the Israel that's being cut off. OK, and if you can understand that, the rest of the chapter will make sense. And it just repeats himself in case you didn't get it the first time. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So those who he foreknew, he's not cast them away. But there are some that have been uh, cut off. OK, well, he's just carry on reading. He's going to explain that. So he goes on to say then, even so at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, what is a remnant? It's in, in the context of the Bible, it's a small group of people out of a larger group of people. So like there was a remnant in Israel. So there was all of Israel, terrible Israel, but there was there was a remnant though. OK, and that that pattern appears in the Bible multiple times. So even in the New Testament, there's a, lot, a large group of people, but there's this remnant within it. And it's according to the election of grace. OK, and he goes on to explain if by grace then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So there's a key verse for you. Paul is separating God's grace from works. You cannot work your way to heaven because it's of grace. Now, if it is of works, fine, but then don't say it's of grace. And that's why trying to read Ephesians 10 to override Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians 2, 8, 10 to override 2, 8, 8 and 9 doesn't work okay keep work separate from grace yes we have been ordained on two good works but keep work separate from grace okay really not that complicated at all what then has israel the group of people not obtained that which he seeks for but the election has obtained it and notice this the rest were blinded so those in the remnant god has not cast them away his people the rest, they were the ones that were blinded. So again, you, you want to talk about Israel being cut off or cast away. Well, the rest were cut, were blinded. You could say the rest were cut off, but the election, the remnant, they have not been cast away. OK, let's see this. The verses that Epusian won't point out to you when he just wants to quote mine the, the next upcoming verses. Now then, um, in verse 11, he says, I say then, have they, the Israelites, stumbled that they should fall? So you could say, is, is, did God deliberately set up the Israelites to fall? Well, no, but, but rather because of their fall or through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. So it's to try and bring them back into the nat natural branches, as, as he explains later in the chapter. So pouring out the gospel to the Gentiles, salvation come to the Gentiles to try and get Israel back in. OK, that, that's the goal there. OK, so it's not that God deliberately set up Israel to fall, but it did fall. And so salvation through the Gentiles, bring them back in. 
Okay. And then look what he says here. I speak to you Gentiles. Now at the moment we're talking plurally to the Gentiles. We're not we're not the endowing just yet. But I speak to you Gentiles, because I, in so much as I am an uh, apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are in my flesh, and what what he means by that is his Israelite brethren, that he might save some of them. So again, he's trying to, that's the goal here is to try and bring the Israelites back into into the natural branches. Okay. And then he goes on to say, um, and if some of the branches be broken off, so again, it's not all, it's not all of the branches, because again, we've got the remnant of his people, but then we've got the rest that were blinded. So not, not all of Israel has been cut off, but some of the branches be broken off. And then this is where he makes it about the vow, you personally. Okay. You as an individual, not, not a collective you. So some of the branches be broken off and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them and with them partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if you, if you or thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root of the root thee. Okay. So what he's basically saying there is don't boast against the Jews or boast against the natural branches of Israel. You were grafted into that same branch. Okay. So that the right tree, the, the right gospel or the right salvation, you were grafted into that same branch. So don't, don't brag against that tree that, that you, you know, you're better than them or anything like that. Okay. It's that, that's the objective of his conversation. It's, it's, it boasts not against the branches. That's the point of why he's, he's telling them this stuff. Okay. Um, the branches that were broken off, so so the fake Israelites, the ones that were blinded, the rest of them, those outside of the remnant, they were broken off. That I or you personally, you might be grafted in. Okay, so the goal of we, we've got we've got Israel, we've got the tiny remnant. That now the remnant's not being cast away. The rest of them, well, let's just throw away this false nation of Israel so that we can actually graft some of you Gentiles in. Okay, that that's what he's saying there essentially. And so why were they broken off? Well, because of unbelief. And so this is what he says. Thou stands, stands by faith, be not high minded. Okay. But, but fear. So you stand by faith. You don't stand by works. You stand by faith. Be not high minded about it. Okay. Because they were broken off from unbelief. Now, what, what did they fall? Well, you look at the conversations that Jesus had with a lot of the Jews. You look at the conversation that John the Baptist had with a lot of Jews. Well, what did John the Baptist say in Luke 3? Think not to say among yourselves, we have Abraham our father. Okay. Jesus said to the Jews in John chapter 8, um, you know, you, you, you think, I know you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me. This did not Abraham. So Jesus was arguing, you are not actually the remnant of Abraham. You are not the, the true descendants of Abraham. You're just the physical seed of Abraham. So a lot of the Jews, they thought they were saved because they were part of the nation of, his, of Israel or they were from Abraham. OK, but if you don't believe, it, it doesn't matter whether you descend from Abraham or not. So really, all he's doing is is just putting that same frame of mind on you personally as a Gentile. OK, now, now, why would this be important? Well, uh, and, and, the, and so look what he says, he said, if God spared not the natural branches, so that's the, the non-remnant Israel, those that were blinded, those who fell off because of unbelief, neither will he spare you. And obviously that's if you fall in this same example of, of unbelief, because that's why they were broken off. And so that's why he says, continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall be cut off. And so, uh, he'll, he'll take words like continue and this, that, and the other. So let, let's just explain some of the stuff that's going on here. Okay. Well, in the New Testament, we have this exact same pattern that the Jews in Israel had in the Old Testament, okay? The Catholics think that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church because they think they monopolize salvation. Well, why do they think they monopolize salvation? Because they claim that their Pope was preceded by another Pope who was preceded by another Pope, and if you go back far enough, it went back to Peter. They think that just because they've got this successive line of Popes, that then they, they, they have salvation by default. Even if they've completely changed the truth of God into a lie, even if they've completely changed the gospel, they think they have salvation by virtue of being Catholic. Okay. Well, sorry, but that's not going to pass. You shall be cut off if you believe that, because if you believe in a false gospel, you, you are in unbelief. Okay. You'll be cut off. And so really what we see there is just the same pattern in the New Testament that we already saw with the Israelites in the Old Testament. So that, that's one way you can look at it. Okay. And so going back then, what, what Epiusen will do is he'll say, he'll use this word continue and he'll say, well, see, if you don't continue, 
you can lose your salvation, right? But but here's what, once again, this is where you just have to completely ignore the rest of the Bible. We already looked much earlier in this refutation about people who walked away from Jesus in John chapter 6. And it said, Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. So we've really only ever got two types of camps. We've got those who believe and we've got those who don't believe. Now, those that were broken off, they were broke off because of unbelief. It doesn't say they lost their belief. It doesn't say they forsook their belief. It doesn't say they just decided to stop believing. It's just unbelief. Okay. We just have that. We just have the opposite of belief. So there's two camps here. So if someone's, if someone doesn't, if an individual person doesn't continue and they stop believing, they fall under unbelief. Okay. That's why they were never saved to begin with. And so they're cut off. Okay. Now you might say, well, how can you really say that he's cut off because wouldn't that imply that he was part of the tree at one point and if, if we're talking about salvation wouldn't that mean that he had salvation and that's a reasonable question okay what you've got to do is not isolate the verse from the rest of the chapter because when it, when he's talking about branches and and you know things being broke obviously you're not literally made out of wood with bits of leaves growing off okay he's using an analogy, if you will, or, or a metaphor, uh, so to speak. Okay, so he's just trying to explain that you can't be part of this natural branch if you follow that example of unbelief. And so we've already seen from this chapter concerning Israel, the rest were blinded. Okay, but the election has obtained it. God has not cast away his people. So the remnant has not been cast away. Everybody else that was trying to be part of this same olive tree, they're the ones that are cast away because they fell in into unbelief. Okay, so let's just apply this to the New Testament. You can't claim that just because you're a Christian, you're going to heaven. Do you believe the gospel or don't you? Well, if you don't believe it, you can claim you're a Christian till you're blue in the face. But you can't be part of the true Israel if you have a false gospel or if you have a false belief or you fall into the example of unbelief. Okay, so what this is here, this is like separating the wheat from the chaff, if you will. To be part of the natural branch, you have to be a person who believes. You have to be elect according to the grace of God. Okay, if you're not elect, you can't be part of that branch. And so that's the point that he's trying to get across when he says cut off. It has nothing to do with you losing your salvation. And if you, let's just say somebody believed for a, a, a moment and then stopped believing. Well, they follow the example of Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not. So if Jesus knew from the beginning they believe not, it's meaningless to say that they used to be saved because Jesus already foresaw that this would happen. Okay, so don't confuse your carnal understanding of time with Jesus' grasp of eternity and everything that he can see outside of time. Okay. And so Paul just continues these same thoughts here that uh, if, if, you know, if, if the Jews or the Israelites, if they don't abide in that unbelief, if they switch to belief, you know, they can they can come back to this natural branch because it belongs to believers. It doesn't belong to the seed of Abraham. It belongs to the righteous children of faith of Abraham. OK, and so you were removed from the olive tree. Uh, I've, I've not highlighted the rest of that. I should have done. But it, you were you were removed from the wild olive tree and you were grafted into the good olive tree. So you were removed from wild brought into the true uh tree okay and so obviously it just goes without saying then that anybody who was part of the natural branches can obviously be grafted back into their own tree if they return to belief okay and again what's he trying to get the do He's trying to get the gentiles to provoke israel to jealousy it's about getting them back in okay um and so you know don't uh don't be wise in your own conceits because this blindness has happened to Israel until the fullness come in. And so Israel shall be saved because God will save the true Israel. OK, but anybody who's an unbeliever, they must be cut off from the natural branch. OK, and so that that's really the point that he's trying to get across in this chapter. So, no, it, it doesn't teach that you can lose your salvation at all. It's just it's just not there. And so uh, what he just points out is through their unbelief, you've obtained mercy because they rejected Jesus when he came. but you accepted Jesus as a Gentile and so you can be grafted into that natural branch because you accept Jesus and those that don't accept Jesus well they're the ones that are cut off from the true branch because the true branch are those who accept Christ by belief okay so that's pretty much all I'm going to say about Romans 11 so we, we can move on to John chapter 15 continuing that same theme about branches being cut off and about those who abide in, in Christ okay